Good morning, good afternoon. My name is John Herbst. I run the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. And we have the great pleasure and honor of hosting today Mr. Hikmet Hajiyev, the foreign policy advisor to the president of Azerbaijan, Mr. Aliyev. Um, I'm going to provide some introductory remarks in place of Damon Wilson, the executive vice president of the council who was pulled away um, for something urgent. Uh, Mr. Hajiyev is coming to us today for the second time. We hosted him um, a year and a half ago, I believe it was. And he is one of Azerbaijan's great diplomats with match wonderful experience. Uh, he is coming to us today um, from Baku. Um, he's coming to us at, at a critical time. Um, our event this morning follows, or this afternoon, depending upon where you are, or this evening, if you're in Baku. Um, our event comes to you today after the summit in Moscow a few weeks back between um, President Aliyev and Prime Minister uh, of Armenia, uh, Pashinyan, and of course, President Putin of Russia. Uh, it comes as we look forward towards uh, what's happening next on this conflict. So I'll now turn this over to Mr. Hajiyev. We'll have a few remarks, then I'll ask him some questions, and then we'll turn to the audience for questions. So Mr. Hajiyev, again, welcome. <clears throat> thank you to you, Ambassador Herbst, and thank you, everyone, uh, for joining this meeting. That's also a great opportunity and privilege for me to share the perspectives of Azerbaijan uh, after the uh, regional developments that we have uh, with Paul uh, in our regional schools conferences. I myself also remember two years ago uh, my presentation at Atlantic Council. That time I was speaking with the narratives and thesis about the you know, war, status quo, occupation, uh, line of confrontation. And today I will be privileged to think a little bit in a different perspective as the status of uh, status quo occupation has been eliminated, and we don't uh, uh, we don't have any war currently, and uh, its uh, prospects has also been eliminated, and its confrontation has been changed for the prospects of the cooperation. Now we have an excellent opportunities in the region of the source Caucasus for uh, regional cooperation, regional integration, and regional inclusivity. And uh, uh, in general, uh, the uh, prospects of confrontation has been changed for the prospects of their cooperation. At the end of the day, it could be win-win situation for the entire region. We're also thinking about a new Pax Caucasia that can involve all three countries of the Caucasus, including surrounding uh, countries from the uh, region, and build a new security architecture. In the meantime, build a new, a new architecture of the regional cooperation and regional integration. But in the meantime, still, we have uh, challenges and difficulties. It requires uh, uh, further uh, uh, streamlining the resources of the regional countries and bringing together good, good intentions. In the meantime, we need also support of our partners from the region and from the beyond to move forward. Without any, any further ado, I'm looking forward to your questions and comments and our fruitful discussion. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Mr. Hajiyev. Um, I forgot to mention in my introductory remarks that this event this morning is in parallel with the event we did with the former prime foreign, former foreign minister of Armenia, Manat Sakhnyan, at the end of October. We believe very certain we think it's very important to provide balance in reporting and events on the South Caucasus. Now, uh, Mr. Hajiyev, um, the Armenians claim that the war in the fall was initiated by Azerbaijan. Um, what is your response to this? But actually, uh, we should take into consideration the last two years, uh, what had happened in the region, and uh, regardless of the claims of Armenian side. But when Pashinyan came to power, I would like to particularly highlight the Dushanba process in 2018, when there was a meeting, in CIS meeting between my president and Prime Minister Pashinyan. At that time, Azerbaijan once again demonstrated its in a constructive engagement and strategic passions to give them a time for the Pashinyan administration and to move forward with regard to uh, resolution of the conflict. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. And on the contrary, what we have uh, seen from the Armenian government side, that Prime Minister Pashinyan went to Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, but knowing whether it's quite extremely sensitive for Azerbaijani people, he said Nagorno-Karabakh is Armenia and Kustov. And then Armenian Minister of Defense, it was also one of the changing elements in the wider regional security architecture. And he said, new wars for new territories. Actually, he declared this preemptive strike concept of the Armenian armed forces and uh, the United States. And then we have seen also in July, Tobus, uh, Tobus event in the border between Armenia and Azerbaijan, where there was a deliberate attack by the armed forces of Armenia 
against an Azerbaijan armed forces, and knowing also that in a couple of months later, Azerbaijan is going to commission as an attack antenna project. In the meantime, the negotiation process, we didn't have any prospects for moving forward, and there was a stagnation in the negotiation process. And all of those elements added to uh, further uh, escalation of the situation, and it also ended up 27th of September, we have seen deliberate attacks by the Armenian armed forces against civilians of Azerbaijan and also armed forces of Azerbaijan. But at that time, we said, enough is enough. And Azerbaijan was obliged to engage in a peace enforcement operation to bring Armenia to the negotiation table and also to ensure security and safety of Azerbaijan civilians and also ensure implementation of UN Security Council resolution on the ground. That is in a, in a short manner, that's in history behind it. Okay. Uh, it's clear that Azerbaijan made um, territorial gains in the course of this conflict. Um, why did Azerbaijan agree to the November 10 ceasefire? In the course of the military operation, there was a different suggestions about say, uh, holding the ceasefire and, uh, and uh, also continuing the negotiation process. Azerbaijan, at every point, you know, they said yes, but give us a timetable. Timetable about withdrawal of armed forces of Armenia from the occupied territories of Azerbaijan. And uh, in the early October, with the mediation of one of the regional countries, there was such a discussion, uh, but Armenian side refused. And then there was another attempt. We said, but yes, we are ready to stop at any moment, but give us a timetable. There should be immediate timetable for withdrawal of Armenian troops. It's also, uh, uh, by the way, part of the demands of the UN Security Council resolution to have a concrete timetable about an withdrawal. Unfortunately, at every opportunity, Armenian side refused to give them a such a timetable. From Azerbaijan perspective, we always saw that in the course of the military operation, one of the strategic elements to know when to stop. And we stopped in a strategic moment where we have achieved our strategic goals. And also our intention was to win a peace. You can win a war, but winning a peace is much more difficult. With that an intention, with a, such an, a goodwill intention, uh, we agreed for the uh, trilateral statement and with a particular indication that Armenian side was also obliged to ensure withdrawal of all their troops from the three strategically important regions of Azerbaijan, that's in Kalbajar, Avdam, and Lachen. It also happened. Okay, thank you. Uh, there were, as you know, several um, attempted ceasefires or announced ceasefires before the November 10 ceasefire. Uh, and one remarkable facet of the November 10 ceasefire was the inclusion of Russian troops as ostensible peacemakers in the Gorna Karabakh. Is Azerbaijan comfortable with that? In general, yes, and uh, it's, part, it's, it's, it's also part of the uh, trilateral statement by three parties and there was a mediation of Russia, Russia, Azerbaijan and Armenia. And as a host country, uh, we agreed for deployment of uh, Russian peacekeeping personnel. It wasn't the exact number. It is a nine, uh, 1,963 uh, personnel have been deployed. So far, uh, we have an open dialogue and communication with the Russian peacekeepers. And they're fulfilling their job in a professional manner and also trying to keep in a good balance and open channel of communi uh, communication between Azerbaijan side and Armenian side. And from that perspective, well, we are uh, satisfied and we are also trying by all means to facilitate uh, their uh, job in general to fulfill their mission. Because Azerbaijan also provided uh, its uh, communication and connectivity lines so that they can also reach effectively and an efficient manner uh, to the areas where peacekeepers have been uh, deployed, especially providing railway system of Azerbaijan, because reaching the uh, area of responsibility of peacekeepers through the Lachin corridor technically is too difficult because Russian troops should have an overflight uh, through the uh, transit countries and then uh, should deploy the troops through the narrow sequence road of Lachin corridor. It requires a lot of resources and time. And we also provided our uh, railway system so that we are the northern part of Azerbaijan, where's a railway and with uh, so logistic and support elements coming to bar the Ardham region of Azerbaijan, and from there it has been uh, delivered. And in the meantime, we're also providing such an access for the humanitarian assistance that you know, peacekeepers are de delivering to the uh, local Armenian community in the uh, designated area. In general, you know, we are uh, in an uh, atmosphere of cooperation, continuing the process and trying to consolidate 
all elements of the trilateral uh, uh, statement on the ground. The November 10 ceasefire did end most of the fighting, but there has been some fighting since then. Is this the reason why Putin convoked Prime Minister Pashinyan and President Aliyev? No, actually, it was not a reason for the January 11th meeting that took place at the trilateral format. Uh, you are right, but since the 10th of uh, November, there have been some incidents that happened. Particularly, we have seen uh, the penetration of Armenian armed forces into the uh, territory of Azerbaijan, and they also tried to concentrate on that particular areas, and it was also and also attacked Azerbaijani civilian and civilian workers. Uh, but uh, January 11th meeting was uh, not a particular link to that incident. On January 11th meeting, we tried to focus on practical and key spheres of cooperation that has been indicated in a clear manner as a trilateral uh, statement. And we have also seen elements of January statement that specifically calls for uh, our joint cooperation through the working group uh, for establishment of the links of communication in the region. But Azerbaijan supports very much to establishing links of communication in the region because everybody knows Armenia, because of this conflict, uh, has been a landlocked and self-isolated country. We would like to uh, rebuild the linkages and connectivity lines, and Armenia can become from the landlocked country into the transforming from the landlocked country into the landlinked country. And also, we have an ex Armenia could also have an opportunities via the transport system of Azerbaijan to reach a uh, Russian market. In a sense, in a wider sense, it could provide excellent opportunities for wide regional cooperation and regional integration. That was a major thrust of the uh, trilateral meeting in January 11th. So then your, your judgment is that those talks were actually very, very useful to help restore, you might say, a sense of peace in the South Caucasus. Exactly. It was about you know, consolidating the result of the trilateral statement and also moving forward, opening the borders, opening the lines of communication, and also ensuring the prospects for Armenia's own integration into the region, and also to build a new uh, architecture of the regional cooperation and based on the new regional security architecture uh, with the involvement of Armenia. Now, Azerbaijan, for me, that is almost possible to involve that and also reveals form of our uh, a railway system that used to be operational even during the Soviet time that uh, links in Azerbaijan and the next one region of Azerbaijan because next one region of Azerbaijan was also under the blockade and we couldn't also have an entire land uh, reach to next one and by opening the borders Azerbaijan will have a uh, linkage to next one and we are next one to Turkey Armenia can also have an opportunity to use Azerbaijan's uh, infrastructure to reach in a Russian market all right. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. But before I do that, I want to ask, I want to ask a different set of questions. Uh, the uh, Yerevan claims that the origin of the conflict that we are discussing goes back to the late Soviet period and pogroms against ethnic Armenians in Azerbaijan. And President Putin also kind of endorsed that publicly recently. Uh, and recently there have been reports of ethnic cleansing of Armenians in your current military operation. Uh, what, is your, what is your reaction to this? Ambassador, I would, uh, uh, you know, uh, I would, I would uh, appreciate the possibility of looking into the future rather than looking at the past. Because unfortunately, uh, our neighbors, uh, Armenian, uh, have become for so many years uh, you know, hostage of the past. And we should change an old narrative, look into the future. And history in this case shouldn't be judgment or judge for us and should be more like an advisor. And we should make a lessons learned to look into the future. If we go to the old historic, historical narrative and accusing one another, it will not be, uh, in a sense, uh, constructive and also productive. It will be, on uh, the contrary, counterproductive. But as regards uh, what happened, and particularly meaning the Sumbaya city of Azerbaijan, uh, that's in a meaning about the events of the 1988. But we have uh, very clear and very well evidenced uh, documents and also investigation process about what happened in the Sumbaya city of Azerbaijan. There was no pogroms, yes, we don't deny it. And there was also crime, crime against the uh, Armenian population of the city. But there was a crime and punishment as well. Even it was in a, uh, a period of the Soviet Union. Uh, but the, even under the Soviet law, Azerbaijan law enforcement authorities ensured that there is a proper investigation. And the ones 
who have committed with, uh, you know, uh, participated in these programs have been severely punished. But my question always to Armenian side, was ever uh, there any attempt to uh, punish the ones who have committed war crimes, crimes against humanity, and ethnic cleansing against Azerbaijanis? And Sunbayat event was also very well orchestrated uh, uh, operation by the KGB of the Soviet Union, and one of the masterminder behind this operation was an ethnic Armenian, Edward Krikaryan. And in an uh, 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 un un understandable manner, this person was also taken out from Azerbaijan by that time Soviet authorities. But Sunbayat event was not in itself an isolated event. It was also a reaction what had happened to indigenous Azerbaijani population in Armenia. Everything starts from there. My own relatives and who are also part of this process, they were the subject to ethnic cleansing in the territory of Armenia. Then it was also continued in the occupied territories of Azerbaijan, which through other 30 years of Armenia's military occupation, that more than one million Azerbaijanis have been ethnically cleansed and was also accompanied with a serious war crimes and military crimes. As regards to the current military operation, and you see that Azerbaijan tried by all means to avoid collateral damage to the civilians. And if you calculate the numbers, how many damages or uh, casualties have been inflicted on Azerbaijan side in terms of the killing the civilians, you can see the real picture. Armenian side have been used in a, uh, in a discriminate manner, indiscriminate manner, scud missiles against Azerbaijan civilians. And Armenian uh, population of Nagorno-Karabakh region of Azerbaijan, we do consider them as a civil uh, citizens of Azerbaijan, and no one can talk about any sort of that ethnic cleansing. Uh, in the course of the military operation, uh, some of them temporarily changed their places, but now they're returning back. And it was in a temporary measures. Before we do see, do consider them as a citizens of Azerbaijan, and in the future process, we would like to see more integrated and inclusive approach uh, with regard to the local Armenian population, but in the meantime, they should also respect the laws and regulations and territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. But in general, if you return back to the old narrative, again, the history and so on, there will be no real perspective for regional cooperation. Let's look into the future. Let's think about the Armenians' own development. I would really take this opportunity to invite uh, Armenian people in general, Armenian scholars, or Armenian, average Armenian citizens, including the diaspora Armenians. Think about in the future. 30 years of military occupation, what you have achieved? Nothing. The cost of occupation was extremely high. I also visited along with the foreign journalists and diplomats to, to occupy the regions of Azerbaijan. Almost everything has been destroyed. My question to Armenian people, Armenian militaries, what you have achieved? You destroyed one floor, once floating cities of Azerbaijan, peacefully and Ardam. Really, we can see the 21st century real picture of Urbicide. Urbicide is a genocide against the cities let's say, but what do you have achieved? Nothing. But now there is a real opportunity for the peace between Armenia and Azerbaijan. I mean the Republic of Armenia and the Republic of Azerbaijan. We can transform the paradigm of the region and build new, uh, new regional security architecture based on the concept that two countries respecting one another's borders, respecting one another's sovereignty, and ensuring that the uh, elements of the use of force are taken out from the agenda. Uh, I understand your point about focusing on the present and the future. Uh, history is very important to understand things, but also sometimes becomes part of the polemics le leading to uh, additional hostilities. Although I understand the importance of historical memory. Uh, all right. So what do you think are the prospects for truly moving forward? You, you outlined the positive results of the meeting in Moscow earlier in the month. So what do you think comes next? What's going to be the next trilateral me, meeting? What's that going to focus on? As a person about the historical memories, you're absolutely right. And uh, we shouldn't uh, forget about our history and Azerbaijani people also not forgetting that the history of the occupation, unfortunately, 30 years, it was an applied and a suffering to Azerbaijani people. We also suffered from the 30 years of military occupation and ethnic cleansing can, uh, has been conducted uh, against an Azerbaijani people. We also never forget it uh, was in a Fujala genocide. It was in one single uh, entire civilian population of the Azerbaijani city of Fujali. Uh, yes, I was in a future perspective of the region, and my president was an initi uh, initiator of the platform 3 plus 3. First, and here, there should be regional ownership and regional initiative 
uh, and also regional responsibility in the region of the South Caucasus. And uh, my president also mentioned that Azerbaijan doesn't have any longer any problem with its neighbors, and meaning Armenia as well. We would like to turn this page and usher in new page in the history of the region and future prospects. And in this process, we also see our uh, regional partner and uh, and friend of Azerbaijan, strategic partner of Azerbaijan, Georgia, of course, as part of the uh, regional process uh, of uh, cooperation. For first, three countries of the region should come uh, closer together and uh, build elements of the new uh, regional cooperation. In the meantime, three big neighbors of Azerbaijan, that's in a, uh, Turkey, that's in a Brazil country for Azerbaijan, Russia and Iran. And, uh, and uh, finally, we could also have an element of three, three plus three format of regional cooperation and regional engagement. Still, we have an open issues, difficulties and challenges among the regional countries. Uh, but with platform, we do hope that provides such an opportunity for wider and comprehensive regional cooperation. But of course, this process is an open, open-ended process. It's also open for our other partners uh, as well. And I do believe here that. United States as well can also contribute to the uh, development of the regional cooperation, including the confidence building measures between Armenia and Azerbaijan. In other words, everyone should adapt to the new uh, geopolitical realities. This new geopolitical realities is about the end of occupation and opening of the new prospects of regional cooperation. But here, so that to make it sustainable and doable, we should avoid elements of revanchism in Armenia. And there should be durable peace between Armenia and Azerbaijan and elements of the confidence building and peace building process between Armenia and Azerbaijan. All right, thank you. Uh, we have a great many questions in the queue, so I think we'll, we'll turn to our audience. Now, I have on, on line with me um, Ambassador Dick Morningstar. And while he comes forward, um, he will ask his own question directly. Before that, we have a question from Alex Raffoglu, if I says, does Azerbaijan still consider the U.S. as one of the mediators of the peace process? And if so, what do you expect from the Biden administration in the months ahead? And after that, Dick will have his question directly to you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can I answer? Please. Yes. Uh, as regards to the Biden administration, of course, we uh, you know, wish all the success to the new administration. There are a lot of familiar faces and people in this new administration. Of course, we have our expectations. We'd like to see more uh, active uh, engagement with the United States uh, new administration with the region of post offices. Uh, as regards to uh, the uh, future uh, peace building process, and we do also expect that the United States new administration and everyone, we should change an old narrative into a new one. And we should not focus on all things. Otherwise, it would make us uh, to return back to the uh, state of war before the 27th of September. It's also our message to our Armenian side, we see that some revanchist forces trying to change the regional narrative to the old one. That's not an hopeful, that's not a productive. Let's focus on the future. As regards to the United States administration, the United States uh, government uh, has a knowledge and experience, particularly in post-conflict reconstruction and development uh, initiatives in many different parts of the uh, world. Of course, it's not my intention to uh, compare our region with an Afghanistan or Iraq as in a completely different atmosphere, but elements of the post conflict reconstruction are an important element. Here we do see why the United States first can contribute effectively to the confidence building elements between Armenia and Azerbaijan and building long term linkages between these two countries. And also, the United States can also contribute to the reconstruction, rehabilitation, and rebuilding processes that Azerbaijan has, been, has already launched launched in the region, including the different connectivity projects, but also uh, that the United States always supported East Coast Corridor and transportation linkages. Well, actually, I, ha I have Ambassador Morningstar's question now, also I'll ask it. Um, given that Azerbaijan has recovered its occupied territories, what incentive does Armenia have to settle as long as Russians will protect Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh? What incentives would Armenia have, and is it realistic? But actually, uh, Armenian community or Armenians uh, who are living in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, so we told you, we, all, uh, we do accept them as an, citizens of Azerbaijan. If they also accept uh, Azerbaijan citizenship and respect Azerbaijan's laws and constitution, and Azerbaijan provide all privileges and also uh, all uh, rights that are uh, enshrined in the laws and constitution of Azerbaijan to the local Armenian community. But my question to them, 
Rather now we are in the day of occupied territories, we can exactly see the level of uh, condition of there in the occupied territories. It was an extreme level of poverty. There was no opportunities for the development, prosperity in this region. And now uh, with the opening uh, all of this, uh, you know, changing the uh, page uh, or turning the page uh, of the regional confrontation into cooperation, we see that a lot of elements for their own integration into the development of Azerbaijan. And they can also uh, you know, get a benefit from uh, the uh, prospects of Azerbaijan's regional development uh, concept. Here we see the real incentives, but they can also benefit. And also, uh, Azerbaijan's market can also provide excellent opportunity for the local Armenian community to bring their products. Let's speak in economic terms. Uh, they can engage in agricultural fields, for example, but if they take their product products to the Armenian market, and it means that they should pass in a seven hours long serpentine lodging corridor and so on and forth. But they can easily, it was also a uh, use of engagement during the Soviet time, even in older times, but they can easily bring their products to the Azerbaijani markets, can also get benefit from that and a higher prices for that. But you know, trading is always better than fighting and so trading opportunities and some other you know, opportunities, including the respecting cultural and religious heritage of Armenian community and uh, of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh region of Azerbaijan is also a key fundamental factor for us. Once again, I would like to reiterate that Azerbaijan always approached with a deep respect to all cultural and religious heritage on its territory. And we are even proud of that, that uh, Christian heritage and Jewish heritage and Islamic heritage in Azerbaijan always live side by side in dignity. And we are also looking forward to rebuild all religious and cultural heritage and monuments and buildings in the deal by territories of Azerbaijan. Unfortunately, a lot of cultural heritage of Azerbaijan has been destroyed in the occupied territories with the sole intention of erasing the trace of Azerbaijani people in those areas, including the mosques. But Azerbaijan will turn with a page of destruction into the page of the reconstruction. Okay, your, your answer there um, leads to another question um, from Matt Bryza. Uh, he asked the following, what are the prospects for possible trilateral investment projects involving Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Turkey, given the final point of the November 10 ceasefire statement, which calls for all transportation routes in the region to be reopened? Indeed, there are excellent prospects for Armenia. Once again, Armenia can be a transit country in the region, and Armenia can learn from that, uh, can earn from that. Uh, and also uh, it can effectively contribute to Armenia's own economic development and also could add value to the products that are produced in Armenia, especially agricultural products, because currently Armenia has a limited choice in terms of the transportation. And changing uh, this kind of paradigm of the regional connectivity uh, will uh, make an Armenian transit country. As regards to opening a uh, Turkish-Armenian uh, border, uh, uh, that's also, you know, could be part of, say, three plus three regional uh, platform, a regional cooperation. President Erdogan, when he was in Baku, and actually he indicated in the press conference with my president about the prospects of cooperation with Armenia. But that's not that's not to think about in a, about in a past, but think about in a future. Not to be hostage of the past and inter and a misinterpreted uh, version of the past. In this case, Armenia should. You know, put an end to its claims against you know, Turkey, against you know, Azerbaijan, and should be a responsible part of the you know, wider regional integration process. And under such circumstances, and I believe Armenia can also be part of this wider uh, you know, regional connectivity project, including the opening of Armenian and Turkish border as well. But first things first, it should end its you know, claims against you know, Turkey and Azerbaijan at the same time. We have a couple of questions relating to Armenian prisoners. Uh, one from Anna Hanyan, the other from Aram Arkun. Um, Anna asked the following. Uh, you, Mr. Hajiyev, you've expressed Baku's openness for building new avenues for regional cooperation. Yet this squares poorly with Baku's unwillingness to release Armenian prisoners within all for all former. What are your thoughts on this gap between rhetoric and reality? First, uh, Mr. Gentleman, as I understood there, uh, you know, from the probably Armenian uh, diaspora community or uh, American Armenians, First, my message to be uh, the, in general by using also this opportunity to the Armenian diaspora communities and special lobby communities. Sometimes, quite frankly, with you gentlemen, uh, you are not part of the solution, but you are part of the problem. As a result of this 
uh, you know, historical hatred uh, of these people, and they pushed an Armenia to enmity with its neighbors. Now to, it's also time to change such a narrative as well. You push an Armenia to the peace, and the people who are in the lobby circles of uh, Armenian Armenian lo lobby circles in the Western countries are enjoying their prosperous life, and even under such circumstances, but still calling for the revanchism. That's not all helpful. That's not counterproductive. Let's think about in a peace, uh, peace and let's think about in a future. As regards on a prisoners of war, and, uh, and you know what, since the end of the 10th of November, under the principle OTO, and we exchanged prisoners of war. And there was also an element of missing persons. I would like to particularly highlight constructive engagement from Azerbaijan side. Even foreign journalists were surprised. It's also one element of the confidence building. Azerbaijan given a full access to the Armenian uh, soldiers, uh, officers, including their family members, uh, under the supervision of the Russian peacekeepers and ICRC representatives, to come to the deoccupied territories with the support of Azerbaijan soldiers to check the areas about the bodies of the missing persons. Since more than two months period, uh, we have uh, managed to retrieve the bodies of 1,200 plus bodies of Armenian soldiers, because Armenian military is not where this battle happened, what happened to them. And it's also, once again, a positive indication in terms of the humanitarian cooperation. As regards, maybe, uh, they are meaning about the 62 Armenian uh, soldiers and officers. But let's be very open with that. First, their identity. They are nationals of the Republic of Armenia. Their military base was in Shirak region of Armenia. They are professional militaries, by the way. They have penetrated territory of Azerbaijan after the 10th of November trilateral statement. They also made a stronghold around Shusha, a uh, city of Azerbaijan, and capturing a couple of the villages. They even dragged heavy artillery to that area and making a stronger fortification systems. And they also killed Azerbaijan civilian service, uh, servants, mobile operator civilian service who were establishing antenna over there. Therefore, under the uh, criminal code of Azerbaijan, even under the international humanitarian law, these people and this group of them as soldiers are not considered POWs, and their category is something different. But in the meantime, we are open for the dialogue and for the communication uh, with the Armenian side, and uh, we are looking forward to discuss this matter as well. But in the meantime, we also do expect some positive engagement from Armenian side. Since the first Karabakh war, we have more than 4,000 missing persons of Azerbaijanis. We know that they have been buried in mass graves. Probably most of them are not alive. But we still, they are asking Armenian side, provide us with a map, where with mass graves, where we can find them. And we are also expecting such a constructive engagement and cooperation uh, from Armenian side. But in general, returning back to the uh, confidence building measures between Armenia and Azerbaijan, I'm glad that since the independence of Azerbaijan, for the first time, Azerbaijan has a full control of its inner borders. 132 kilometers of Azerbaijan borders with Iran was an open along under the occupation, along the Fizuli, Jabra, and Zengilan regions of Azerbaijan, and also Azerbaijan border with Armenia along Zengilan, Lubadli, Lachin, and Kalbaja regions of Azerbaijan is in 500 kilometers uh, uh, length of the borders. But now we are under full control uh, of these borders, and uh, uh, I'm glad to say that. And in a sense, it cannot be considered exactly demarcation or delimitation, but at least based on the understanding of the GPS uh, uh, indications, we have somehow demarcated the borders of Armenia and Azerbaijan. And Armenia also accepted that these are the borders under the constitution of Armenia they have identified as the borderlines of uh, Armenia. These are the all positive indications that we have. We also have a different channels of communication and the direct communication between Baku and Yerevan. Let's you know, build on that and let's build based on that move forward. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, I have a request from um, Ms. Ahanyan to point out that she's a scholar and a woman and her ethnicity has nothing to do with the question she asked. But the next question, um, we have a couple of questions, one from Ann Phillips, one from um, Hydra Hussein regarding the return of Azerbaijanis to the territories that returned to Azerbaijan. Are there plans for the internally displaced people to go back? Yes, and first, the occupied territories of Azerbaijan, and particularly the seven regions uh, of Azerbaijan that have been deoccupied. Well, now, as a regional government, we have established interagency coordination mechanism because, under such circumstances, 
coordination, cooperation, and consistency among the key government institutions is in a fundamental. And our key focus on reconstruction, rebuilding, and rehabilitation of these territories and ensuring dignified and secure return of Azerbaijani IDPs and refugees. Uh, you know, unfortunately, nothing has been left on these territories. Everything has been destroyed. When Fizuli region of Azerbaijan has been uh, liberated and Fizuli was one of the prosperous city of Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijani soldiers couldn't find any solid building even to put Azerbaijan in flag. Therefore, it requires to build an infrastructure and including uh, the social infrastructure and also uh, building uh, you know, government institutions on the ground. And uh, we are currently started in an urban planning process and also started with a demographic planning, uh, which amount of their people and within uh, a certain period of time uh, that we would like to return to these territories. We already started the process, but we are in the planning phase. But the key fundamental problem that we are facing is a uh, mine problem, humanitarian demining we require, and also remnants of war, unexploded ordinances. It's a, one of the key priorities because, unfortunately, Armenian side, in the course of the military operation, contaminated whole area, first line of contact, as a five kilometer, kilometers depth area, but were contemplated with the mines and exploded ordinances. And then other areas, and also in the process of uh, retreats, Armenian armed forces also planted a lot of uh, mines and exploded ordinances. But clearing and taking out was risk, and uh, we are looking forward uh, to start with a widespread uh, reconstruction process. But currently, we focus. Uh, we have already started with a key focus on building the infrastructure. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Ambassador Dick Hoagland. Would like to know what role do you see for the OSCE Minsk Group in the peace process, and do you have any concrete suggestions? Actually, OSCE Minsk Group co chairs in Azerbaijan in early December, and we have a discussion and consultation. General, uh, in Azerbaijan, unfortunately, the reputation and image of the co chairs of OSCE Minsk Group process is not on a high due to uh, understandable reasons because 30 years we have rendered too much confidence for the resolution of this conflict. Unfortunately, it never happened. And uh, we didn't expect that, based on the mandate, OSC co chairs can uh, push forward uh, with a peace uh, process and also ensure the occupation of the occupied territories. It's, only, it's not about the government officers, it's also wider public opinion in Azerbaijan, and it's an open secret. And I believe that co chairs also know about that. But what about the future role? Uh, future role of the uh, OSC Minsk Group co chairs, but we, what we do expect. They should also adapt with new realities. Old narrative uh, is not applicable uh, any longer. Old narrative should be changed, and new narrative should be built. Where is it? Where could be comparative advantage uh, of co-chairs? Because so many years they are talking to both sides. They also uh, carry the messages and can used to carry the messages between the parties. Or we do expect that they can also contribute to building confidence between Armenia and Azerbaijan through sort of different uh, projects. Here, we do see particular comparative advantage uh, of OSC Minsk Group co-chair. But what about the status issue, some other issues? Let's be frank uh, open on that issue, but uh, currently focusing unnecessarily on the status issue is going to be counterproductive. It will create unnecessary expectation for the uh, local uh, Armenian community, and it will also work for the hands of the uh, radicals in Armenia and give unnecessary expectation for them. And therefore, let's focus on confidence building measures. Let's also focus on peace building elements between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Here we see particular role for OSC peace group co chairs as well, but they should also be ready to be adapted to these uh, uh, new realities. And also, uh, they should also think about their own uh, future reputation in Azerbaijan society and also in the context of the wider international community. But so many years they have been rendered with such a mandate for the resolution of the conflict. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. All right. We have another question here from Ambassador Rob Sakuta. Um, you talk about the new security arrangements, excuse me, and new security situation, and the possibility of developing economic and cooperative relations in the Caucasus, but the level of hostility and suspicion on both sides is high. What role might the United States and other outside powers play in helping to build this component of peace in the Caucasus? Yeah, in general, some bones are fresh. Let's be realistic. And uh, because a dust needs to be settled uh, in both communities, because Azerbaijan also has an occasion of this. We also have an, our 
uh, soldiers and officers who died in the course of the military operation. And there was also a massive attack by Armenian armed forces against Azerbaijan civilians and using theater ballistic missiles. We have more than 100 Azerbaijan civilians in the course of this recent hostilities have been killed, including the kids and Azerbaijan's major cities were bombed, uh, were bombed uh, with the SCAD missiles by Saddam Hussein against Israel. Uh, uh, these are the uh, elements of the solutions, these are the elements of the emotions in both societies. Uh, but uh, we do think that gradually, step by step, we can move forward to confidence uh, building elements into countries, into societies, and uh, uh, based uh, on the new model of uh, cooperation between Armenia and Azerbaijan. What a role United States can play, and again, United States has on a unilateral basis, and also as a OAC means group for chair country, can contribute building direct relations and based on confidence between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and also deflect elements of revanchism in Armenian society, and uh, and also uh, bring Armenia to uh, the new uh, uh, realism that Armenia should also reconcile with the new realities on the ground. In the meantime, United States, based on some knowledge and expertise in some other parts of the uh, world, can contribute to the reconstruction, the mining activities, and rebuilding processes uh, that has been completely destroyed in the, the occupied territories uh, of Azerbaijan. Here, I would like to also use the opportunity to highlight the future role about the private sector of the United States, because Azerbaijan is going to open a new uh, prospects of uh, reconstruction, a uh, wider and comprehensive reconstruction process. And my president also declared the occupied territories of Azerbaijan as a green energy zone and a smart city zone, as we are looking forward to build smart cities in that region. Here we do see that based on the now uh, knowledge, American companies and private sector can also contribute along with the uh, United States government support to this process, and we can build effective elements of the public private partnership and cooperation. Well, Mr. Hajiev, your remarks suggest a question to me, which I'll interject here. Um, you talk about the need for some adjustment in attitude on the Armenian side of this conflict. What about adjustment in attitude on the Azerbaijani side? And also connected to this, um, you talk about the reach out to American business. Um, Armenian Americans are extraordinary business folks. Um, what might you do to reach out to them to involve them in these economic projects you're discussing? In general, I agree with you that narrative should be changed in both societies. And uh, to an extent, it's not only justifiable, but sometimes you see the emotions in both societies in the different layers of the societies. And in Armenian society, we also careful and uh, you know, attentively monitoring social media and media of Armenia. We also see uh, the elements of uh, Azerbaijanophobia and uh, humiliating uh, narrative with regard to Azerbaijan and Azerbaijan. It's unfortunate it's also in a case. Unfortunately, for so many years, it also become a part and parcel of Armenian education system, a part of the textbook and school books of Armenian education system. It needs to be changed. And uh, unfortunately, now we see some uh, calls for real analysis of the situation by some Armenian scholars, including, by the way, by some Armenian diaspora representatives, uh, but calling realistic analysis and assessment, and also putting aside the myths that have been built for so many years in Armenian society uh, with regard to the neighbors and so on. It needs to be changed in both societies on that trend, I agree. As regards to the Armenian business community, in general, we also in anticipation of hearing positive messages of Armenian diaspora and lobby communities, whether they are ready to support the peace. Unfortunately, so far we haven't seen, especially the certain radical groups uh, among the Armen American uh, Armenian uh, lobby circles, including the, uh, some Armenian lobby groups in France, are calling for the enmity, are calling for revanchism, are calling for the new wars for new territories. They should change their mindset and they should change their stereotype. And they're also reaching out to some politicians in their respective countries, including the United States. I do also regret that some Congress members are pursuing narrow lobby interests instead of the national security interests of the United States. And no one should be hostage of that. I'm not talking about the wider diaspora community. Unfortunately, there are some marginalized, some such groups as well. First, we do expect from this their narrative and then they can also contribute to the regional development and regional cooperation between Armenia and its neighbors. 
All right. I, I understand your point of view. I can understand how that might be interpreted differently elsewhere. Fine. Okay. Arn Dahlhog has, a, I think, an interesting question. Azerbaijan has signed the European Charter of Local Self-Government, and so has Armenia. Could this be a starting point for discussion on the political future of Nagorno-Karabakh? Yeah, Armenia and Azerbaijan, yes, you know, I agree with you, it's part of the uh, certain uh, conventions. Uh, but, uh, you know, as regards the uh, status issue, status issue, uh, it's, you know, uh, it's not an appropriate time to discuss a status issue. Uh, but let's also be realistic. As part of the negotiation process for so many years, Azerbaijan was supporting updated moderate principles. There was a different consideration about the status issue and so on. It never happened. Never happened. We always expected that Armenia liberate regions as there was a different modalities or formulas, you know, five plus two, three plus two, plus two, and so on. And with the ultimate discussion about some status, it never happened. Unfortunately, there was a voices in Armenia and everyone said that, okay, we occupy territories and let's legitimize it and annex with territories. But unfortunately, with status quo occupation has been changed on the battleground. Azerbaijan also have an assembly losses. And as part of the peace enforcement operation, finally, we brought Armenia to the peace, to the negotiation table, and Armenia agreed that they're going to implement, first of all, UN demands of the UN Security Council resolutions. The original paradigm has changed. Let's also be uh, realistic. And uh, uh, it's not too premature to talk about a uh, status issue, but of course, we respect the uh, Armenian community of Nagorno-Karabakh region of Azerbaijan, all their uh, rights under the constitution of Azerbaijan as the citizens uh, of uh, Azerbaijan. And about the future perspectives, about the self rule, it's going to matter for the future discussions, but we should build, uh, we should think about the confidence building metrics. Really, we need about the confidence. Some emotions are uh, currently extremely high, but also key game changer is our confidence between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And it can positively affect some other regional developments as well. All right, I understand. I think we have time for one more question. Um, Daniel Kenyon asks, what is the short-term and long-term status of Turkish forces as peacekeepers in Nagorno-Karabakh and other Azerbaijan, Azerbaijani territory? General, let me highlight once again uh, the role of the Turkey. Unfortunately, uh, there was an, a lot of speculations and unnecessary uh, kind of false propaganda in the court of the military operation. Uh, but uh, some uh, said that Turkey is part of the military operation and so on and so forth. F-16s are here, or oh, Phantom F-16s, you know, troop down uh, uh, SU-25 of Armenian armed forces. These are all but, uh, simply just speculation. Uh, we do appreciate Turkey's, uh, you know, support to Azerbaijan, moral, political, and diplomatic. And Turkey's support to Azerbaijan was also an important deterrent factor. And Turkey is also a regional country. Turkey is also one of the, uh, you know, only countries in the region that have uh, borders with Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia at the same time. Therefore, in the future uh, paradigm of the regional security architecture, we see active role of uh, Turkey, uh, can, uh, and but Turkey can also contribute to building of the trilateral or multilateral form of regional cooperation in the region, including the elements of the opening borders of Armenia with the Turkey and Azerbaijan if Armenia answers and claims against both of these countries. As regards the Turkish forces, we don't have a uh, military presence of the armed force of Turkey in Azerbaijan. Unfortunately, it was also yet another speculation. And they came here for their military drills for uh, part of the uh, military training. And but we have joint monitoring center in Avdan region of Azerbaijan, uh, where uh, there are Turkish officers and Russian officers are placed. And this monitoring center will become very operational soon. Currently, we are working on a certain technical parameters. Once there, Turkish uh, officers will also have a chance to monitor development of the peacekeeping operation. We do think that it will be yet another element of their confidence and element of contributing to the successful completion of the mission of peacekeepers. Mr. Hajiyev, thank you very much for your time. Uh, we had about 200 people watching. We probably have 30 questions unanswered, but we'll have to just go. We'd like to see you in the future and we will continue to do events on the South Caucasus, making sure we hear both voices from Yerevan and from Baku. Well, thank you all for attending. Thank you, Mr. Hajiya, for your wonderful conversation. And we look forward to seeing you all again in the future. 
thank you, Ambassador Herbs. I thank you and all Atlantic Council for this opportunity. And I also thank everyone for participating and also for the excellent questions.